Talafa, and we are, I'm been given the task to present on behalf of the students of Base SD USP. For me, I didn't go through the RSD process when it started in my undergraduate levels and postgraduate levels. It started when I entered uh, my postgraduate level in P um, climate change, which is four online courses with Dr. Keith Morrison, when he entered into the university in 2014. Coming from a uh, geography and land management background, I never actually followed the RSD. I implemented those skills. I know how to do the research, but I was not actually structured to do what to do. So when I entered the postgraduate level, I was like, oh my God, can I do this? How postgrad level is so difficult and there's so much research to do, especially when you're involved with climate change. Every semester we have four, two courses of online courses and they are basically on adaptation, learning on the climate science and other fields of how we can implement climate change professionals and researchers into the Pacific. So what we were involved in in postgrad level is communicating with adaptation and how different communities in the Pacific and also in Fiji, how we are able to help them with this issue. So for me, going into postgrad level and most of my colleagues that we all started in postgrad, we were all new to this RSD. On the first day when we met Dr. Keith Morrison, where he introduced RSD in such a fabulous manner that I think we will never forget. He brings up this, <laughs> he brings up this, um, when we start learning on, uh, he brought up the RSD framework from, not as a whole, but as pieces. We had to, we, we were given a uh, particular um, case study or project in which we had to get those skills and be able to, um, sorry, do you have a question? <laughs> in which we had to use those skills into the, our particular case study. So we started with the um, embark and clarify and all those. So by the end of the first semester, we were very uh, familiarized with all the procedures and the facets that John was explaining today. So by the second semester, when we went into the university, we were like, okay, so this is how all what we were supposed to do. Because when we came to undergraduate level, we were so used to teachers telling us what to do, do this, do that, this is where you go to the library, you get your research, go to your online forms and all that, and you do that. We have to go see librarians, go see our tutors, be late with assignments, asking, knocking on their doors if we can have more time because we do not know what to do or how to do it. So um, for that, I would like to thank Dr. John and the university for implementing RSD, which has helped not just me, but my fellow colleagues, which you will also see. And I think it's a good initiative to start from the grassroots level, especially undergraduate level, because I've gone past that and I was not good at it. And so I'm trying to learn through it now, postgrad and on to masters, and hopefully continue. <coughs> so the overview of the RSD framework. Uh, we all know what how the RSD framework looks like, and this, this one. Yeah. But this is how we looked at it from our own perspective of what it looked like. Hello. <laughs> okay, it encompasses and integrates everything a student needs to achieve a good result. So when we were going through post um, undergraduate level, when a, um, our lecturers and tutors would give us assignments to do, we would, we would never get our assignments back or we, we would just get a mark. So we would always have that question in our mind. What did we do wrong or what was it that was lacking or what was missing? So what the RSD did for us when we went to the postgraduate level, it made us have better marks. So what I used to get very low marks in my degree level, but when I went to postgrad level, I saw the improvement, and I'm sure Dr. Keith could also see that in all the other students. We were also able to deal with all the other issues with confidence. I think you could see that frightening here, but I'm having the confidence to speak in front of all of you on our behalf. We were also, um, like uh, Hina mentioned, it was used as a rubric, but um, from our faculty, we used how Dr. Keith um, mentioned it to us first, apart from the rubrics. So when the rubrics were checked, so we would always go 
oh, we got this wrong, so we have to have more um, implementation on that, focus more on that so we could get more marks on that instead of the other ones that we got more marks on. So it was like a checklist. So if I got three out of three in the first one, oh yes, and I get a zero in the one, oh, that's the one I have to do. <laughs> and it was also a platform that was able to approach the, in a more social perspective. As you know, the Pacific is very, um, has multiple and diverse cultures. Even in our class, we have students from the Caribbean, two students from the Caribbean, about four from PNG, four from the Vanuatu, mostly in Fiji, and the other Pacific Islanders. So uh, we have created a, a video of how we have seen a student that comes out with an RSD framework, or any framework that would help a student better their research and in also um, contribute to the research field and work which everyone here is part of. So this is how we viewed it in a short video. their journey so but they will always have a help to, so that everyone reaches that outcome <laughs> I'm coming on now to show how I saw, I saw it but I'm put my glasses on So for, for me, um, the, the value of it um, for the courses, these two large postgraduate courses, online courses, is that it, its holistic nature, that it, the different facets which are covered, um, give credibility and to legitimate the, the, the different aspects of what's important for sustainable development and climate change adaptation. So it, it enabled me to be able to uh, justify the bottom line, financial, ecological, social, cultural, spiritual, and allowed a possibility for common language between those, because it doesn't actually exist in any substantive sense. So you've got to rely on uh, discovering connections, intuitive connections, and this enabled that to occur. It also, and that's partly how that's done, is that it allows or sort of facilitates integration of the cognitive and the effective and also spirituality. Um, and I think the most important thing, and what I wasn't expecting at first, but it slowly emerged, is uh, very, very effective. And it's what I'm using mostly now, um, its capability for, is it transcends the research and the research. And that's really important um, when you're dealing with communities. It makes it possible to um, carry out participatory action research. It makes it possible to engage with communities. It makes it possible to address some of the ethical issues and justice issues. Um, and even though we, this morning we talked about, well, maybe traditional knowledge is, um, hasn't got formal aspects, um, but there's a lot of informal, in. Um, in, in all our communities, whether traditional or otherwise, 
And this also allows to transcend the formal and informal, allows them to be integrated. That, that's been my experience. So we start with the, the whole person. If, if, you, if you've got philosophical training in Greek, you'll see it's, it's compatible with Plato to have the same sense. So it's, it's universal, I, I would argue. So these, these three things are, are present and they're inseparable. And need not to be, not in the sense of just you can, you've really got to make sure that they're not um, covered up. They've, they've got to be engaged. And there's something holding them together. So that has to be our starting point, both in ourselves as a researcher and also who we're researching. But that whole person doesn't exist outside of being in a within a community. And that is a community, interpersonal relationships, and some sort of inclusive civil society. And there's culture, which is uh, the key aspect of that, which I'm saying there is informal, because we, we're not taught culture. We're, we're inculcated into it through the way we've brought up and so on. Regulations. That is a formal. And markets, which are formal and informal. And those interrelate. And they interrelate with the person, or the person interrelates with them, both ways. The values, norms, and the world views. Sorry, world views there, typo. And the markets, reciprocity of goods and services. And the regulations, these provide the sort of definitions and boundary about conservation, civil defense, and welfare. So this is um, how this is experienced. But that sustainable civil society, it's ideal, with whole persons in communion, is part of belonging into the natural environment. And that natural environment is not only um, material world, it's also a world of hope. There's some horizon, there's some purpose, there's some direction, there's some development, um, there's some vision. The natural environment provides ecosystem services and the, the horizon provides inspiration for values, norms and world views. So this is a, a a conceptualization of the, the world in which our communities live. And so unless uh, us researchers um, are able to engage with that, then we're, we're not being helpful. The RSD then has got the challenge of enabling the students to be able to engage with that reality. So. I've been working on systematizing that. And the way in which I find it most useful to is the, the triple loop learning um, ideas. Um, and integrating the teacher led learning, where I think RSD fits in. RSD provides a framework um, and enables a, a teacher to be able to use it. But the reality, and perhaps especially with online courses, but I don't believe it's any less than any other type of course, is also self regulatory learning. And in USP, we can map that onto graduate attributes. Things like creativity, professionalism, specific consciousness, ethics, team building, and there's a few more. Now, yeah, the, the RSD is, is a key part of this, but what I'm pointing out is that for the RSD to work, I found it needs to be contextualized into this wider process. And back to the <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. This was the purpose of RSD from me and my fellow students. It prepared us to do critical thinking, 
Um, at undergraduate level and at um, when we go through undergraduate hundred level, two hundred, three hundred level, sometimes we just when we're given a question like, um, what do we do with this sort of thing? How do we go do it? We were also enabled to deal with criticism with an open mind. <laughs> From our perspective, this was a, a very interesting idea. I think one of my friends got it with. Um, our criticism with this is when we have that open mind as students, we were able, to, we're using the RSD, when we were criticized in our, when we go out into our field work, or at times our teachers might say, oh, this was not good enough. I think you should do better, but this is how you're supposed to do it. And at times students feel down or think that what they have done was that was the effort that they have put in. Why did your teacher tell me to do otherwise or do something better and then what I have presented? Why couldn't the teacher explain it in more detail or tell me something that would be worthwhile writing? It was also it helped the student who doesn't know how to do research. So well, that was a very uh, very important point uh, as we had to follow different steps of um, uh, doing research, which is why we really liked the RSD and also the one that was um, the pedagogy, which if you started with a research or research topic and you're lost in the middle of it, you would always go back and embark and restart your thinking. I have done that a million times. And I've, I've gone um, three or four weeks into the semester, I've, been, I've got my topic, and then I was like, no, I'm not supposed to be doing this. So I went back. I went back to the library, I got new research, got new literature, and I've got finally a topic to work on. And it also aids in the communication and information. Sometimes we students, when we see teachers in their office, their big office and all their science, oh, how do I approach my teacher? How do I go and explain to my teacher that I'm lacking in this, I need help, or I need more information in this. At times, students are very scared to approach teachers, and from my perspective, teachers that will always open up to us are the ones we usually stick to, are the ones we would always go to, to um, for our problems. Ones that will just walk around, don't even say a warning or to anything to us, we'll be like, oh no, I'm scared of that teacher, I would not go and see that teacher. Um. Just to, to carry on, um, how the RSD, uh, how I found the RSD, and how I used the RSD, the purpose of the RSD. Um, I, I framed it totally different to this this matrix, um, and so this is actually how I visualise it, and this is how I'm communicating it to students. Um, it's in terms of uh, this triple loop learning. So the triple loop learning, the single loop learning is when there's a focus, where there is a problem, where you know what to achieve. Well, that's it's the most e extrinsic. And so, yes, that's, that's a type of knowledge you learn. And then double loop learning is when you realize that actually there's multiple ways of looking at this, multiple perspectives, um, we could say different social constructions of the situation, and, you've got to re and you realize that well, there's multiple social construction, we've got to juxtapose those and realize that it's sort of none of those and more of those. And then we go into triple loop learning and that's when you begin to transgress that and you begin to be creative. But that's also when you begin to realize that it's, it's got to be going somewhere, there's a sense of purpose and, and the effects and so on become very important, otherwise it, it actually just becomes a game. So these two outer loops are described well and analyzed well by constructivism. They're relative. That's the important thing. So it's about ensuring the students realize that this knowledge, this disciplinary knowledge, this scientific knowledge is relative. There's other ways it could be looked at. There's different cultures. They've got their own sciences. So that's one of the things you have to go through. And there's this sort of dichotomy between traditional knowledge and scientific knowledge. Well, we have to sort of deconstruct that so people realize, well, our traditional knowledge has got science as well. And um, science is traditional knowledge, it's got its <coughs> disciplines. It's not scientific or traditional. It's, it's, it's something that's different to that. That, that dichotomy doesn't work. Um, but we look at, we could look at as a shallow level of traditional knowledge. It's shallow because it's 
concerned with the extrinsic. And then we go into this deeper level of traditional knowledge, which um, we can only call spirituality, and that's actually the term which the students use. And that's where there's real transgression um, of uh, disciplines, of cultures, of genders, of race, of class, nations, law, um, and that's what gives adaptive capacity. And we're talking about climate change, we're talking about sustainability, we're talking about the need for changing the direction of development. This, this these transgressions are, are vitally necessary. And this process is a process of increasing autonomy. So that's where the RSD comes in. So this research skill development maps on very well to this process as you go up these different levels here, from the left to the right. Increasing levels of autonomy is this increasing ability, capacity of the researcher, is this increasing <coughs> adaptive capacity, is this move to this into triple loop learning. But it's also just as equally increasing ability to carry out dialogue. It's ability to engage with others. It's ability to be able to listen. Those two occur equally. So I, I think this could just as well be reframed not in levels of autonomy, but levels of interdependence. So where it's all heading is towards individuation, which is the same thing as communion. Or personal development, which is the same thing as community development. And that is what gives hope. So that's what we're wanting in the for the students, for their thinking of their future, that's what we want our communities to have through our interaction with them. <coughs> How this maps directly onto the RSD is that the outer extrinsic level of um, single loop learning, where there's specific goals and goals to be achieved, that's prescribed research. Low level autonomy low level of dialogue required. Boundary research, still there. You move into double loop learning where you've got to juxtapose um, different social constructions. You need to have scaffolding, scaffolded research where um, you just make sure that people are able to hold together difference without sort of falling off the, off the wagon. And then self-actuated research as they come into triple loop learning, where they are required to be able to internalize the ability to have um, some sense of uh, purpose um, and, and some vision. And the, the different facets of research are the different dimensions which are always present. Uh, but never really separate and they're always present but they become increasingly integrated and focused. Uh, that's my experience of this. <coughs>